So uh, today we're going to go through, we're going to just give an overview of, uh, I guess, the historical evolution of quantum mechanics, and then focus a little bit on the uh, string gerlach experiment, which I think is a good example of the precepts of quantum. Uh, there was a book by uh, Richard Leiboff where he taught quantum from a set of four postulates. And I really like that approach because having these postulates say, well, if these are true, then everything holds together. And for all of our observations, these postulates all hold true. Uh, but it makes understanding what's happening uh, work fairly well. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, a fairly straightforward to, way of teaching. But before that, I wanted to give you an overview of uh, how this quantum concept came about. And it really occurred uh, from, say, 1890 to 1930, where people were discovering that the world behaved differently uh, than they anticipated. Uh, and they found you know, light and waves behave as particles, particles behave as, as waves, and ultimately, in order to understand the observations, they moved to a statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics, and that was, uh, or that is, where we are today. People talk a lot about you know, quantum being spooky and weird and scary, and it's not really. It's just behaves with a different set of rules. I mean, if you think about you know the first time that a human saw a duckbill platypus, they probably thought, "Oh, this is you know creepy and scared and weird because it's a you know furry mammal with a duckbill and venomous claws," and then they realized it tastes like chicken if you cook it well, and everything was right in the world. But uh, as I say, quantum is not creepy or strange or weird, it's just that when it was first discovered, it challenged people, and now we know that there's a regular set of rules that involves a statistical interpretation. <clears throat> and I'd like to begin the review of, of the history uh, with the black body radiation. And you know, this uh, black body radiation uh, is a description of the uh, wavelength of light coming from a perfect emitter. Uh, the original theory was uh, Raleigh Jean. And the Raleigh Gene theory assumed that the energy being emitted by a black body could take any value of energy. And it was a, a spectacular failure. Uh, it had what's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. If you have the, uh, the density of uh, uh, photons being emitted as a function of uh, wavelength and temperature versus the wavelength, uh, what we observe is that it does something like that. And what uh, Raleigh Jean said is that it should do this. And it goes off to infinity. So down here in the ultraviolet region, they call this the ultraviolet catastrophe. So Raleigh Jean fits into here. And uh, Planck came and he corrected this. And Planck's theory fits extremely well. And the only thing that Planck did differently was he said that energy, the energy of the light cannot be uh, continuous. It has to be discretized. And I wanted to show you uh, where that came from. So, 1879, uh, we had the Stefan Boltzmann Law. Uh, 
which says that the total emissive power from a black body, which is RT, as a function of temperature, uh, is equal to sigma T to the fourth. And this T, I, I, I think it's the, I can't really name the, the, uh, the constant, but it, it's a constant uh, that's, that's well characterized. This uh, total emissivity is made up of the integral over the, the spectral emittance, which is the integral from zero to infinity, r d lambda. So we have the spectral emittance, which is uh, frequency dependent. So this is essentially uh, going to exist. This is normalized. And the spectral emittance can be rewritten, I guess over here, in terms of the energy distribution. This energy distribution obeys what's called uh, Wien's law. which really says that the energy distribution as a function of wavelength and temperature goes as some function of the wavelength and temperature divided by the wavelength raised to the fifth. So that's Fien's law. So these are empirical, and we need any theory we have to, to match these. Uh, the measurements, uh, the high quality measurements, let's call them, were uh, Lumar by uh, and string machine uh, 1899. Uh, so the first theory I said was the Raleigh gene theory and I'll gene theory uh, said that you have some uh, black body any of this it says that your, your black body is basically a uh, hole in it, and what happens is light will come in and it will bounce around and never escape. So it's a perfect absorber. At the same time, it's also a perfect emitter, and there's going to be some some set of frequencies of EM radiation that reflect inside that box, and occasionally uh, it comes out. Uh, the, uh, they solve this using a, a classical uh, e &M, and they get the number of nodes per volume. Of eight pi over to the fourth. Again, in the notes, I've got this worked out in detail, uh, but we're not going to go through every step uh, in the lecture. 
And that means that they can express the energy density or the energy distribution as 8 pi over lambda to the fourth times E bar, where this is the average. And G emitted. So it's not exact, but it's, it's a good approximation, and at least it should give us the right functional relationships. Uh, so then the trick was, well, how do you get how do you get the average energy? And then for that, they used uh, for that they used uh, uh, the Boltzmann distribution. As long as we're building this up, I have my notes here, I should remind you that uh, what we're saying about this is that the atoms in that black body are uh, simple harmonic oscillators. And that means that we have a relationship, which, and this is from classical ENM, that there's a relationship between the frequency, the speed of light, and the wavelength. So the way that we get this average energy emitted is from the Boltzmann distribution. Which tells us that the expectation value of the energy is equal to the integral from zero to infinity, because we can have uh, zero to infinity for our wavelength uh, of the energy x negative beta e d e over integral from zero to infinity x negative beta e d e. So this is the Boltzmann distribution, which gives us uh, it's, it's the st statistical mechanical expression for uh, a classical distribution of particles. And well, skipping ahead and over I decided I want to skip the integral or not because it's actually pretty elegant the way it all works out. Uh, by the way, I love math. It's really hard to skip writing down math whenever you have something which is really cool. Uh, but the right thing to do is skip it. Uh, and just write down that this gives us an answer of equal to k bar, sorry, kt. because beta is just one of a kt. Uh, it's in the notes, and you'll see that. Uh, which means it's equal to 8 pi over lambda to the fourth kt. And this is our ultraviolet catastrophe. Right? Because it goes over Latin four. So what Plop did, and I should be correct years for this. What Plot did is be in teal. This is nineteen oh. Oh, just by the way, was before Rally 
a gene. It's just not something that was believable because uh, he's saying that energy has to be quantized. But if you say that energy is quantized, he said this. Yet all of their original theory up to that. And here he said E is equal to <clears throat> and E naught. E naught is some quantized energy, and N is an integer. And when you do that, you now get E is equal to the sum of N equals zero to infinity N E naught X negative beta N E naught over sum N equals zero to infinity X negative beta N E naught. We replaced E, which is a continuum, with a quantized value, which means we replace the integral with the sum, and that gives us E naught over X beta E naught minus one, which means that now Planck gives us rho is equal to rho function lambda t is equal to 8 pi over lambda to the fourth e naught over x <coughs> beta e naught minus 1. And this can be made to satisfy Wien's Beam's law if E naught is equal to H nu is equal to H C over lambda, which means that now rho is proportional to lambda to the negative 5. This h is Planck's constant. And it is 6.626 e to the negative 34 joule second. And it turns out uh, Planck's constant is going to show up in probably every lecture for the remainder of the course. Uh, because there's something about that which is just uh, universally right. So this is something that I, I went through all the math in this because I thought it was pretty amazing that one simple uh, change went from a, a solution that blows up to a solution that <clears throat> has the, the proper functional form. Questions about, what? yeah. Uh, is that supposed to be kt equals beta or kt equals one over oh, beta? Oh, sorry. Yep, beta to beta one, inverse. Yeah, good catch. So this was uh, Planck, who was Einstein's mentor, and uh, it really was, you know, the beginning. And it's also something to note that, you know, he had a good idea of what was happening, uh, even when others were uh, more skeptical. So this is going to bring us to the photoelectric effect, which was, I guess you can think of that as, as Einstein taking uh, Planck's uh, h-bar nu and uh, taking it one step further uh, because he's 
not just saying that uh, uh, you know the, the radiation coming out is is, is uh, quantized, but the fields itself are quantized. Uh, Most of the history I'm going to go over rather quickly. I just I'm going to say I hate to pass up good math. Uh, so the photoelectric effect uh, hurts in 1887. Found that. Uh, Sparks are emitted from irradiated uh, metals. And uh, this guy named Leonard. Uh, he made uh, a measurement uh, of the current coming from uh, jumping across a, uh, a gap in which one side had a, uh, a metal plate that was being irradiated. It was basically a device that looked like this. some vacuum tube that was located in. And here's some you know, flashlight or whatever. And when the light strikes this plate, an electron hops off and hits this plate, and you get a current. Uh, so, what Leonard did was he measured the IV characteristics by introducing an applied voltage and a measured current. And if you do that, you get something that looks like this. V. It looks like that. So you're applying a voltage here and you're, you're pulling charge off. But even when the voltage is equal to zero, you still get some current. And at some point, when you start applying a reverse bias, you get E zero, which is the stopping voltage. What we're basically saying, how large of a reverse voltage or reverse bias do we need to keep the electrons from being able to hop across that gap? And what was interesting was that as you change the intensity of the light, you would get higher light intensity, but V0 stayed the same. In contrast, if you changed the uh, frequency of light, So what Einstein proposed was that these light were not really waves and 
before this, people uh, had assumed that they're all waves. Uh, but he'd taken this and claimed that the light was a particle, a photon of energy, and the light had So five years after Planck, Einstein proposed this. So, oh, can you read the green marker in the back? Okay. I tend to use markers until they're on their last gasp. Last gasp. So if, if you have a problem, let me know, and I can I can switch to something else. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry, equals e is equal to h bar or uh, h nu. So what this means is it means that. Uh, we can express the energy of the photon uh, coming off uh, as a function of, of the frequency. Now, the way to think about the experiment is to say that this electron is coming off with some kinetic energy, and this potential is <clears throat> reversing, and when you get the stopping voltage is when the potential energy from the applied voltage is enough to e exactly equal the uh, kinetic energy so your current goes to zero. So, one half m v, right, v max, so my nu's and my v's look very similar. The v has a tail, the nu goes backwards. Uh, one half mv max, so that's the maximum voltage coming off, is equal to h nu. This is the uh, intrinsic energy of the photon. Minus w. And this w is the work function. basically how much energy does it take for us to strip an electron out of the surface. So there's some energy to take the electron out, and then the electron is going to carry with it some intrinsic energy associated with its frequency. And the voltage, the energy due to the voltage is uh, V times the charge on the electron, and the exact stopping power is going to be equal to E V naught. So that's the energy required to uh, exactly counter the intrinsic energy of the electron minus the work function, or the kinetic energy. Which means that V naught is equal to H nu over E minus W over E. And it also means that V max equals zero when H, V, I call this a T, I don't know why I call this a T, but T is equal to W. So we got some measurement of, of the work function. So by measuring the stopping voltage, we're measuring the work function in the metal. And uh, Millikan. You may know that from the Millikan charge. Uh, in 1914 uh, to 1916, uh, measure the work function. Uh, 
versus new T. And I can't remember which metal he did this for, but has that linear uh, relationship. Uh, he also measured the charge on the electron, and he did that for the purpose of verifying the uh, Planck constant, and he got the same Planck constant that Planck had in the uh, Black body radiation. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I missed it. What is B sub T or B? B sub T. Uh, that is the. No, I wrote my notes. A sub T. B sub T. I'm sorry. This new sub T is the frequency of light where the V max is equal to zero, where basically you are uh, exactly at the, the, the stopping power. So if you have a V naught versus Bt, it should have a, a linear relationship between frequency and and uh, the stopping voltage. Um, he did this for different metals. Yes. And things. Yeah. And it is two years of this, but he also verified the Planck constant through this. So. From this point, things accelerated uh, significantly because people were starting to realize that there was something to this quantization. And what people were really looking at is the relationship between radiation and matter. So, 19. 1909, uh, Thompson Thompson scattering was discovered, and you know, basically people discovered that if you have some metal and you hit it with light, that Light is then emitted. So this is coherent. Uh, actually, sorry, not light. Well, it is light, but it x rays. Uh, so you have coherent scattering. And because of this, uh, Thompson said that we had this plum pudding model. This is a uh, So what Thompson said was that um, matter was basically uh, positive and negative charges all mixed up together. Uh, and these x-rays are coming off coherently. But there's, there's a problem with this model, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Rutherford. 1911, Rutherford uh, observed that uh, beta particles would be shot at a, a gold, uh, gold leaf, a gold film, uh, most of the time. Would pass through, but sometimes they would be reflected. So. Path majority go forward, but sometimes they would be reflected. Uh, so this led to uh, the idea that the plum pudding model uh, wasn't accurate, but instead you have large nucleus that would then have uh, electrons around them. Right? And you know, this is uh, kind of that picture you get of electrons circling around a nucleus. Uh, it's also worth noting that when these came off, the scattering was incoherent. 
meaning that it was an elastic event, which is why he postulated that the alpha particles were actually bouncing off another particle, the nucleus, and this was uh, you know, a billiard ball type model. This Rutherford atom has a, a fairly significant problem, and that was corrected by Bohr in uh, 1913, and we'll, we'll come to that shortly. Uh, 1912, Lowy discovers X ray diffraction. Right? So you have planes of atoms and X-rays coming in, and for certain orientations, you'll get constructive interference. some geometries. Right, that was a big deal for people in uh, materials. Well, materials people weren't so interested in it, but uh, we are now because this is the, the basis for all of our uh, crystallography. And in fact, uh, if you discover a new phase of, or a new crystal structure, it doesn't count unless it comes out of x-ray. So it may be something that you're working in a TEM and you observe electron diffraction. Uh, it's not recognized by the crystallographic community unless uh, you have x-ray uh, confirmation of it. And 1923, uh, going back to uh, kind of a combination of, of, of Thompson and Rutherford, uh, Compton observes uh, incoherent scattering of x-rays. So, again, you've got an x-ray coming in. And an x-ray coming off at some other angle. The important thing here is that when it comes off at another angle, its energy and momentum have changed, which means that what we're basically seeing is an x-ray and it has some elastic event, or sorry, inelastic event, uh, in which uh, it bangs against electron. Uh, and this was in 1923. Uh, 1923, the uh, electron from the incoherent scattering event was uh, detected by Beta and Wilson. And again in 1925, Beta and Geiger. This is the uh, and then further in nineteen twenty seven, Bless <clears throat> measured the electron's energy. confirmation now of, of what's happening. And this was the development of people trying to understand uh, photons uh, interacting with uh, matter. Uh, now, I guess in parallel to that, people were interested in, in what is matter. And you know, some of these interactions shed light on it. Uh, for example, you know, the Rutherford model. Uh, 
Uh, but the Rutherford model has a uh, significant flaw. And that flaw has to do with the fact that if you have some nucleus and you've got an electron, let's imagine it's going around some circle like that, uh, as the electron goes around the circle, you say, well, the electron's uh, you know, negatively charged, so there's some attraction. Uh, but in order for something to go around the circle, it has to be accelerating. Right? There has to be some acceleration inward. Right? You know this from you know, swinging something <coughs> around the string. You've got this uh, centripetal force. And if you're taking a charge and you're accelerating it, there has to be some type of radiation being given off. And it's not. We don't have matter constantly giving off radiation. Uh, what's more, if it's not giving off radiation to change its energy, then what it really should do is it should circle around and eventually uh, crash into the nucleus. So there, there's something wrong with that. So let's, let's talk about the development of atomic theory. Seventeen fifty-two, uh, Melville. Uh, he observed uh, that light from an incandescent gas gives off a uh, discrete uh, spectrum of wavelengths. So let's call this up. Uh, a regular pattern to this uh, in the case of hydrogen. And we have this Balmer series. Which I'm sure you remember that from probably the first week of chemistry lab. To C n squared over n squared minus 4. So C the constant 3, 6, 4, 6, Angstrom and n is an integer. So that was the Balmer series for hydrogen. Uh, I use angstrom all the time in this class. If you're not familiar with it, one angstrom is one times ten to the minus ten uh, meters. It's not SI, but it's really convenient because if someone said to you, you know, how large is an atom, you say yeah, it's about an angstrom. So it's it's just a really handy way to think. Uh, so, Balmer uh, had this Balmer series, which is an empirical observation, and then uh, Rydberg took and built on that in uh, 1888. He had the. She uh, says that. Uh, We know now that what he's really talking about is moving between different quantum levels. Uh, but he's able to characterize his wavelength, and this is the Rydberg constant. Which is 109677.5. Otherwise known as 13.6 electron volt. It's one of those numbers which is really handy to memorize if you ever decide to become a theorist. Uh, and this is where we were in, in terms of, of um, observation. Uh, now, coming back to the, the problem of Rutherford. <coughs> 
Uh, this is where Bohr comes from. So 1913, Bohr proposed a solution. And, and what Bohr said was that the reason electrons don't spiral to their death is that they can only exist in discrete uh, levels or discrete orbitals. So the Bohr model was that you have some nucleus, and then you have some discrete orbitals. And when an electron transitions from one to the next, energy is given off. But the important thing is that there's no way for this electron from here to spiral in and uh, uh, crash. And in order for him to uh, explain this, explain the quantization, something can't be quantized, and he chose to quantize the angular momentum. Which makes sense, right? You've got something going around in a circle, and you want to say that it has to be some distance. Uh, quantizing the angular momentum makes sense. So L, he said, is going to be equal to N H bar is n h over 2 pi. So it's a reduced uh, Planck's constant h bar. And because this is angular momentum, this is also equal to m v r, which is the classical angular momentum. And it quantized, and it is an integer. Okay, so we've got the angular momentum quantized, uh, but we want to describe what's happening. We still have to talk about uh, the energy of, of things, uh, these electrons that are moving around these orbitals. And because they don't move, uh, that means that at each of these quantized orbitals, we have exactly the force to hold them in place. The attractive force is a Coulombic force. Coulomb force z e squared over r squared, and that is equal to the centripetal force so to m v e squared over r. Um, you may notice here that we do not have a 4 pi epsilon naught in there. Uh, another thing in this class is we're going to be working in what's called uh, uh, natural units or uh, atomic units. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, as we get a little bit more into the computations. But the important thing here is that by choosing your units correctly, you can get rid of all of those four pi epsilons and c's and nagging little constants that follow you around forever. Uh, every, all these constants happen to be equal to one if you pick the, the proper units. Uh, pretty amazing, actually. Uh, so, and I hate getting around four pi epsilons. So uh, we're not going to be doing that, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. But right now we've got this uh, equality which means that z e squared over r squared r over m is equal to v squared, or z e squared over r m v 
is equal to V, which is another V over there. And because we have this relationship, we're able to take and write we're able to take and write that velocity is equal to z e squared over h bar n and we're able to write that r is equal to h bar n squared over m z e squared. <clears throat> right, so that comes from combining uh, these. Now, we're interested in the total energy and the difference in the total energy, of course, to get the, the Balmer series. So we have the total energy is equal to T, that is kinetic energy, plus V, potential energy. Uh, so throughout the class, I'm using capital T for kinetic and, and capital V for potential energy, which means that total energy is equal to one half m v squared minus z e squared over r, which is equal to negative one half m z e squared over h bar squared one over n squared e tote, which we call e sub n. So now we have an expression for the energy of the orbitals as a function of the atomic number, uh, charge, uh, reduced Planck constant, mass, and n where n is an integer. So we can now say that you know, this delta E equal to E whatever, n plus 1 minus E n, or whatever that energy difference is between the orbitals. And it gives us the, the correct physical form, because again, we have this 1 over n squared. Uh, and it turns out it's actually right. Uh, Borg got the right answer for the wrong reasons, and later in the class we'll go back and see the, the full-blown solution to the hydrogen atom. Uh, but this is really important, because he's really showing that quantization is everywhere. It's not just energy and not just uh, photons. But it's everywhere, including uh, the uh, angular momentum. And you'll see that the angular momentum and spin and even you know, magnetic field is quantized. We have quanta of magnetization. Uh, so this actually underlies uh, all of the world around us. And what this led to, or I should say, to summarize what we've observed, is that uh, energy is quantized and we observed that electromagnetic waves are quantized internal properties of matter are quantized. And 
everything is pointing to that our continual model Continuum quantities are uh, actually Actually quantize discrete items, and that's everything's been done so far. And now, the big step, or at least what I consider one of the bigger steps, was De Broglie said, "Well, we've just shown that all of these waves and all of these things that we thought were continuous are actually discretized. Does that mean that everything we think is discretized is actually a wave?" And and this was uh, 1925, the de Broglie hypothesis. Is that particles have wave properties. And this was huge. Uh, he said, okay, if they have a, a wave properties, then that means that there has to be a relationship between the wave properties and you know, what we think of as particles, and they're related through, the through their momentum. So he says, he hypothesized that lambda is equal to h, because it seems like a good guess. Uh, it is a pretty good guess. Uh, times p, the momentum. And if we talk about the waves in terms of a uh, like a plane wave, a plane wave has a, uh, a wave vector associated with it, means that we can also say p is equal to h bar k. So you've got the reduced Planck constant, and that's the wave vector. Well, let's call it the, the amplitude of k. Of, of your wave. And what's nice about this is it lets us go back to the Bohr atom and say, well, we get the Bohr atom, and the reason the Bohr atom works, which is not exactly right, but it, I say, they got the right answer for the wrong reason, is because in order for an electron, which is a particle, to exist, it has to obey boundary conditions, and exist as a standing wave in that orbital. Or n lambda is equal to 2 pi r. So if you have the radius of your orbital. And uh, the de Broglie uh, hypothesis was born out. So this is 1925, 1927, the Davidson Germer experiment. Electron diffraction. And that proved to us that electrons, which we had before considered as particles, are now waves. And uh, that really kind of broke everything open. Uh, so where do we go from here? Well, where we go from here is trying to figure out how to talk about these waves. And if we say, well, there's waves, then well, there must be some wave equation that describes their motion. And 
least within the non-relativistic world, which still existed, uh, still exists for most of us, uh, but uh, in our uh, non-relativistic world, we can say that this wave obeys the Schrodinger equation. derivative with respect to time of a wave function p. So this is the Schrodinger time-dependent equation. Those are just constants up front. These are wave equation n. That is an operator, and we'll talk more about operators probably the second half of next class, but this is the Hamiltonian operator. And this is really the, the name of the game now, is setting up and solving this equation. Um, and if the equation doesn't change, but your boundary conditions do, and as a result of changing the boundary conditions, that's what gives you your quantization. Uh, another uh, significant observation was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. initial form was that the uncertainty in the position multiplied by the uncertainty in the momentum has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Um, and this uh, turns out is also inherent to all of quantum mechanics. It's not just position and momentum but it's actually all of the observables have relationships between them that give us this uncertainty. And this really means that there's limits to our knowledge, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. It just means that we have to change the way we think. And 1927, this guy named Born, uh, he suggested a probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that's where we are today. Everything that has uh, come about comes from that. Uh, good time? Yeah, good little time. So the basics of this probabilistic interpretation is that the wave function uh, gives us the probability distribution. So if you have the wave function, the wave function is complex. So it has a real and imaginary part. So if you take this, this is the mod squared of the wave function. So that is the wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate, and we'll see that later. But we take that in some infinitesimal space, dx, dy, dz, it is equal to the probability to find the particle within that space. Probability dx, dy, Z. So because the nature of probability, it means that if I have some probability in some infinitesimal space and I look everywhere, it has to normalize to 1. So if I take the integral 
from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, p, x, y, z, dx, dy, dz, that has to be equal to 1. And as a result, if we substitute in for p, the mod squared of the wave function, that has to be equal to 1. And this is called the normalization constraint. So the normalization constraint uh, is not something that's observed. It's something that's a consequence of our using a probabilistic interpretation. It doesn't seem wrong, right? It seems like it's the, it's the right way to do things, but you should recognize that uh, this normalization constraint is, is actually coming about because of the way that we interpret it. 